The Berlin lorry attack, which killed 12 people, was terrorism, says the German government. The lorry ploughed into a Christmas market in the heart of Berlin last night. Almost 50 others were injured, some of them critically. Eyewitnesses say it drove through the crowds at a speed of around 40 miles an hour. I saw people lying on the on the ground in, you know, all bodies being twisted, you know, like arms, legs were, you know, people were on top of each other. As tributes are laid for the victims, Angela Merkel speaks of the shock of the German people. How can we live with the fact that during a carefree walk through a Christmas market, in a place where we celebrate life, a murderer can bring death to so many? An asylum seeker from Pakistan was arrested last night, but the authorities say they cannot be sure that they have the right man. Also on the programme. Russian investigators arrive in Turkey to find out what led to the assassination of Russia's ambassador by an off-duty policeman in Ankara. Scotland's First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, sets out her plans for protecting Scotland's place in Europe after Brexit. And the new treatment for early-stage prostate cancer that surgeons are describing as a huge leap forward. Here, the cost to commuters, the Southern Rail dispute, could have lost the region £300 million. And Express Deliveries in Dorset. We're with a mail order company in the run-up to Christmas. Good afternoon and welcome to the BBC News at One. Germany's Chancellor Angela Merkel says she is appalled, shocked and deeply saddened by last night's attack on a Christmas market in Berlin. Twelve people died and 48 were injured when a lorry drove into a crowd in the centre of Germany's capital. Germany's interior ministry says there is no doubt that it was a terrorist attack. But in the last half hour, police in Berlin have said that they cannot be sure that the man they arrested last night was the attacker. Our correspondent, Paul Adams, has this report. Berlin early this morning. Amid the scattered debris of the festive season, a weapon of mass murder is slowly removed. For the second time this year, a lorry has been used to target traditional celebrations in Europe. Chaotic scenes last night after the truck ploughed at speed through the market. Wooden stalls splintered and dozens of people caught up in the mayhem. I hear a loud noise from the houses that were um, destroyed by the truck and um, heard some screams and yeah, that was uh, the first impression. I can actually show you, um, it's from my balcony as well, um, it's just like uh, from my house is um, two minutes drive. What was in my mind, I, you, could, you, can't, you can't think of anything, you were just shocked and you just want to help those people, I went down. People were, um, you know, asking for help, but we just, um, I just took two wooden parts on, on top of them, but I couldn't do much, I couldn't help them all. I saw people lying on the, on the ground in, you know, all bodies being twisted, you know, like arms, legs were, you know, people were on top of each other. The truck had Polish number plates. A body found in the cab is thought to be that of its Polish driver. But a masked man behind the wheel escaped on foot. Soon afterwards, a suspect was picked up just over a mile away. He's said to be a Pakistani citizen who arrived in Germany a year ago. If this was the work of an asylum seeker, it poses a real challenge for the woman who threw open the country's doors over a year ago. I weiß dass es für uns alle besonders schwer zu ertragen wäre. I know it will be particularly difficult for us all to bear if it is confirmed that the perpetrator had asked for protection and asylum in Germany. That would be particularly repulsive for the many, many Germans who are engaged day in, day out in helping refugees and for those who genuinely do need our protection and who are striving to integrate themselves into our country. Germany's interior minister said security would be stepped up across the country, but the Germans should not succumb to fear. We must not compromise our, our lifestyle, the way we want to live. We must not let people who want to destroy that way of life. 
The attack took place next to the ruined church that stands as a monument to the savagery of the Second World War. The priest Martin Germer says it's important for Germans to tell each other what the people of France have told each other, that life must not be stopped. At the scene of the massacre, the Christmas stalls are shuttered and silent. But there's fresh anxiety, the police now saying they're not sure if they have the right man. The perpetrator of this, they fear, may still be at large. Paul Adams, BBC News. Let's get the latest now from our correspondent, Damien McGuinness, who is in Berlin. And uh, let's pick up on that point that Paul just made. The authorities now saying there is some uncertainty about the suspect they have. Well, what they're saying, Sophie, is that they have a suspect, and that is the Pakistani 23-year-old who came as an asylum seeker last year, as um, we heard in that report. Um, what they're saying, though, is that he denies any involvement in this incident. And until they finish the investigations and until they've, they know exactly what happened, they can't be definitively certain that he is, in fact, guilty. But that's very different from also saying that necessarily the attacker is still on the run. So we have to be very careful about jumping to any conclusions. And that's what the, the officials are all saying here, is that we still know too little to be sure about what's happening. But what is clear is that if this attacker does turn out to be, in fact, an asylum seeker, that will not only be a slap in the face for all those Germans who helped migrants over the past year and a half, it'll also be a massive political problem for Chancellor Angela Merkel because she, like no other politician here in Germany, is closely associated with that, what many people see as humanitarian gesture to help legitimate refugees. And the problem is that, of course, as you know, Sophie, we've got elections here in Germany next September. If it turns out that this attacker was in fact an asylum seeker, that could really be a blow for her politically in those elections. Damien McGuinness, thank you. Here, the Metropolitan Police says it's carrying out a routine review of its plans for Christmas and the New Year in the light of the attack in Berlin. Here's our security correspondent, Frank Gardner. After the carnage, the search for clues. German forensic teams have been going through the wreckage left by last night's attack. There was never much doubt it was deliberate. Now attention is turning to the likely motive. Analysts suspect it may have been a response to a call by jihadists. This is something that um, Inspire, the, the uh, magazine of Al-Qaeda, uh, has been promoting among their followers that these kind of um, homeland attacks, easy to organize, uh, very little coordination needed. This is, uh, this is what they've been proposing. The attack in Berlin bears a striking similarity to what happened in Nice on Bastille Day five months ago. A Tunisian jihadist rammed a 19-ton truck into a crowd of pedestrians, killing 86 people. So, can this sort of low-tech, high-speed attack be prevented? Answer, yes, if you're prepared to put in this level of protective security. This demonstration in Berkshire shows a seven-ton truck being successfully stopped in its tracks. But you can't protect everywhere, and one of Britain's most experienced counter-terrorism officers says the key is intelligence. Well, more bollards and troops on the streets uh, is not, absolutely not the answer to this threat. Um, you have to build your intelligence capabilities more, you have to encourage people to come forward, in particular you have to encourage the Muslim community to come forward and trust the agencies. Uh, and report information and concerns that they've got. And that has been happening. Information from the British public has already led to plots being stopped. But as barriers like this one in Birmingham go up to protect Christmas shoppers, it's a reminder that the terror threat level in Britain is at severe, meaning an attack is thought highly likely. The Metropolitan Police say they're now reviewing security measures. In Berlin, the clues are still being analysed. And the question remains, what more needs to happen to stop further attacks like this? Frank Gardner, BBC News. Well, we will, of course, have continuing coverage of the aftermath of that attack at the Christmas market in Berlin here on BBC News. And you can also keep up to date with the latest developments online on the BBC News website.
President Putin has promised to step up the fight against terror after Russia's ambassador in Turkey was murdered yesterday. Andrei Kar Karlov was shot dead by an off-duty police officer as he was making a speech in Ankara. The leaders of both Russia and Turkey have described the killing as an attempt to damage relations between the two countries, which have backed opposing sides in the Syrian civil war. From Moscow, Steve Rosenberg reports. In Moscow today, there were flowers outside the foreign ministry. A makeshift shrine in memory of Andrei Karlov, the Russian ambassador assassinated in Turkey. Terrorism won't win, it says. To many Russians, the war on terror has felt far away. This murder has made people remember. Now it's hitting home. Inside, the foreign ministers of Russia and Turkey paid their respects. Ambassador Karlov was killed just hours before the start of talks here on Syria between Russia, Turkey and Iran. If we work together, said the Turkish foreign minister, we'll find out who was behind this wretched, despicable crime. In Ankara, the Russian ambassador had been making a speech at a photo exhibition. Standing behind him, the assassin, a 22-year-old riot squad police officer, he starts shooting and shouting. God is greatest. Don't forget about Aleppo, about Syria. So long as they aren't safe, you won't taste safety either. The assassination of Russia's ambassador to Turkey has shocked this country. And its president, Vladimir Putin, says there can be only one response, a strengthening of the fight against terror. But the problem for Russia and for other countries waging such a war on terror is that there is no end in sight. Still, this is a war Moscow is determined to win. We should uh, send a clear message to those who support terrorists, to terrorists with our air forces and with our military. Any attack towards Russians would be, uh, would have a very dangerous and terrible results for those who, who can possibly stand in, uh, behind them. The politicians are talking tough, but the public is nervous. I was upset on a human level, and I was upset as a, as a citizen of a country which is being affected and humiliated in a way. But I also really, really hope that it won't lead to escalation of the situation in general. Today, a team of Russian detectives arrived in Turkey. This will be a joint investigation. Moscow and Ankara displaying a united front in the face of terror. We'll get the latest from Moscow in a moment, but first to Ankara and our correspondent Mark Lowen. Mark, what is the latest on the investigation? Well, Sophie, as you heard there in Steve's report, a, a joint commission, a Turkish-Russian commission, has now been set up to investigate the murder that happened here at the Art Gallery in Ankara. Uh, Eighteen Russian officials arrived in Ankara this morning, including forensic experts and prosecutors. They'll be working with their Turkish counterparts to investigate the murder. At the same time, six people have now been detained, including relatives and the former flatmate of the gunman, the 22-year-old Mevlut Mert Altantash. They'll be trying to find out exactly who this man was and what his most were. Was he a lone wolf? Did he have links to any uh, opposition groups in Syria or jihadist groups? Was he trying to take revenge for Turkey's softening of its stance towards Russia uh, and, and the Syrian conflict? Or was he, as some sources within the, the Turkish government have suggested, did he have links to the Islamist movement that Turkey's government blames for orchestrating the failed coup here back in July, led by the US-based cleric Fethullah Gulen? He says there is absolutely no link between his movement and the gunman. This afternoon, the coffin of the ambassador will be flown back to Moscow for burial uh, in a ceremony from the airport here in Ankara. And the authorities here in, in Ankara have said that the road that the Russian embassy is located on will be renamed in the ambassador's honour, Andrei Karlov Street. And Steve Rosenberg in Moscow. What impact could this have on the relationship between Russia and Turkey? Well, Moscow and Ankara are putting forward a united front at the moment. In recent times, these two countries have had a difficult, sometimes explosive relationship. Just think back just over a year to when uh, the Turkish Air Force shot down a Russian bomber. It said it strayed into Turkish airspace. But in recent months, both countries have tried to put their differences behind them and forge a new relationship, a new partnership, basically because both presidents, Putin and Erdogan, believe it's in their interest to do so. 
in terms of what happens in Syria and in terms of economic ties. So, over the last few hours, Moscow and Ankara have been going out of their way to project this united front, to make it clear they are determined not to let um, this crime come between them and to maintain this unity. Steve Rosenberg in Moscow and Mark Lohan in Ankara, thank you both very much. The Syrian army has been broadcasting messages to the last remaining rebel-held enclaves of eastern Aleppo, saying it plans to enter the area later today. It's urging anyone still there to leave. Yesterday, 15,000 people fled the east of the city, but no one really knows how many people are still left. Well, let's speak to our correspondent, James Longman, who is in neighbouring Beirut. And are the evacuations still continuing? Can people who want to get out leave? Yes, Sophie, uh, they are, uh, and they're continuing at quite a pace. We understand that at least 25,000 people have been able to leave since these evacuations began on Thursday. Uh, they were, of course, stalled over the weekend and now have begun again in earnest. Uh, there are thousands left inside. That's according to the International Committee for the Red Cross, who are managing these evacuations, but they are moving very quickly indeed. At the same time, there are evacuations in other parts of the country, the two government villages where uh, it was agreed that people would be simultaneously evacuated from, they too have been able to leave. So this whole process has moved very quickly indeed. And it's quite clear that the government in Damascus wants this to happen as soon as possible. They see this as their chance to claim back territory. Those announcements that you mentioned there that, that were made over loudspeaker to East Aleppo, telling the last militants to leave or they'll be killed by the, uh, uh, the army that will soon take over those last remaining rebel enclaves. That's all about claiming back territory because this really is uh, a defining moment for the Syrian regime in this war. Uh, just in the last few hours, we know that in a sports complex in the west of Aleppo, the ruling party held a celebratory victory celebration for this, uh, for this victory, as they call it. So um, this is, in the next two, 24 to 48 hours, we know that Aleppo, the whole of the city of Aleppo, will be back in regime control. James Longman in Beirut. Thank you. The time is just after quarter past one, our top story this lunchtime. The German government says last night's attack on a Berlin Christmas market in which 12 people were killed was an act of terror. And still to come, England collapse against India. The latest defeat is their eighth in a row. In South today at 1.30, express deliveries in Dorset, behind the scenes with a mail order company in the run-up to Christmas. And growing old gracefully, the Abingdon man who started skating on his 50th birthday 30 years ago. Scotland's First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, has been setting out how Scotland could stay in the European single market without the rest of the UK. The First Minister says leaving the free trade bloc would be potentially devastating to Scotland's long-term prosperity. In the EU referendum, Scotland voted by a large majority to remain in the EU. Nicola Sturgeon wants Scotland to be given more independence from Westminster so that a special status with the EU could be negotiated. Our Scotland correspondent Lorna Gordon is in Edinburgh for us. Lorna. Sophie Nicola Sturgeon, Scotland's First Minister, described Brexit today as an unprecedented situation, not of Scotland's making. She insists that the options for a second referendum on Scottish independence must remain on the table, but she said this weighty document was about exploring all options going forward. It's almost six months since the UK voted to leave the EU and a majority in Scotland voted to stay. Since then, there's been plenty of political positioning on what any Brexit negotiations should involve, but not much detail. Now, today, Scotland's First Minister set out how she hopes Scotland's interests can be protected. We propose that the UK as a whole should stay in the single market by remaining a party to the European Economic Area Agreement. I accept that there is a mandate in England and Wales to take the UK out of the EU. However, I do not accept that there is a mandate to take any part of the UK out of the single market. Calls too from Miss Sturgeon for further powers to be devolved to the Scottish Parliament. Fishing and farming policy should, she said, be transferred from Brussels directly to Holyrood. She argued that MSPs should be able to legislate in key areas such as employment and should have the power to set immigration policy too. 
This is the uh, hopper here. Mm -hmm. This Scottish company, which employs seven people, sees Europe as a growing market for its products and a source of talent for its team. Its Finnish owner says clarity is needed about what Brexit will mean for his business. We need some certainty. Um, I personally need some, some certainty. I mean, I'm born in Finland. I've lived in the UK for 15 years. Um, we're a growing business. We need to know where do we find future employees that we want to hire. Um, and I want to know, can I stay in the UK myself? The Conservatives insist there will be no separate deals for different parts of the UK. What we absolutely do not want to see uh, is anything that jeopardises uh, Scotland's trading relationship with the rest of the UK. Scotland trades four times as much with the rest of the UK as it does with the whole of the European Union. And that's the single market that we've really got to preserve. Some light shed today by Scotland's government on what it wants from the Brexit negotiations, but with no formal role in those talks, they are reliant on the government at Westminster to agree. Well, ultimately, it will be up to Theresa May, uh, the Prime Minister, and her cabinet to decide what of these proposals from the Scottish government to take forward. Theresa May has said she will look very carefully at these proposals, and there will be a meeting of the devolved administrations in January. So, Laura, thank you. Buckingham Palace has announced that the Queen is stepping down as patron from a number of national organisations. They're being passed on to other members of the royal family. Our royal correspondent Nicholas Witchell is here and it's 25 in all. So quite a small number. It's actually about 5%. She has roughly 600 patronages and she is redistributing 25 of them from large charities like Save the Children UK and the NSPCC to smaller ones like the Royal College of Needlework and uh, Battersea Dogs Home. So they're being redistributed to other members of the royal family. For example, Prince Charles will take over the uh, Holocaust Day Memorial Trust. Uh, Bernardo's, I think, will be taken over by the Duchess of Cornwall. She, of course, with a great fondness for dogs, has visited Battersea Dogs Home on several occasions. So I think she will take that on. Um, there are rugby patronages. Uh, William will take on the Welsh Rugby Union and unsurprisingly Prince Harry will take on the Rugby Football Union. What's not known are the tennis patronages. Now the Queen, not notably interested in, in Wimbledon, has not attended very much. So both Wimbledon and the Lawn Tennis Association, one would imagine that they would probably go to the Duchess of Cambridge, but that's not confirmed yet. And this is all part of the, the gradual lightening of the load for the Queen, uh, to give her a workload which, as officials would say, is more appropriate to someone who is 90 years old. Nick Witchell, thank you. Every year, more than 45,000 men in the UK are diagnosed with prostate cancer and 11,000 die from the disease. But scientists have developed a new technique which surgeons are calling a huge leap forward. The treatment involves lasers and a drug made from deep sea bacteria to destroy tumours without causing severe side effects. Here's our health correspondent James Gallagher. Gerald's now free from prostate cancer and feeling good. But when he was diagnosed, he faced a conundrum. Treat the tumour, but almost certainly develop long-term side effects like impotence or incontinence, or let the tumour grow. Many men choose to wait and see, but then Gerald's surgeon offered him something pioneering. He was telling me uh, that this would be the best treatment uh, for me, uh, and having taken into account the other treatments, um, I was looking onward with my life and wanted to have the same uh, way of living, as it were, um, as I had enjoyed in the past for the future. And I feel that, that the treatment I've had has confirmed that. Here's the technology that killed Gerald's cancer. This drug's made from bacteria that grow in the dark depths of the ocean. It's only toxic when exposed to light. It's injected into the prostate. Then up to 10 of these lasers are inserted into the tumour to activate the drug and kill just the cancerous tissue. More than 400 men took part in the trial. Nearly half had no signs of cancer after treatment and no patients had serious long-term side effects. The harms with traditional treatments have always been the side effects, um, urinary incontinence, in other words, leaking urine and requiring pads, uh, sexual difficulties, which occurs in the majority of men who have treatment. To have a new treatment now that we can administer to men who are eligible that is virtually free of those side effects is truly transformative. It could be a welcome advance for the more than 40,000 men who are diagnosed with prostate cancer in the UK each year. 
This treatment is a huge step forward for prostate cancer. We've sort of seen uh, in the past where you have to either take out the whole prostate gland itself or use radiotherapy, so those men will be over-treated. Uh, whereas with this uh, particular uh, treatment, we should be able to identify the, the cancers that will respond best to it. This is the technology that produces the right amount of light to kill those cancerous cells inside the prostate. However, while this is incredibly promising, it's not yet ready for patients and needs to be assessed by regulators next year. Doctors also want to see how the procedure affects long-term survival. But for now, Gerald says he's one of the lucky ones and that his life is worry-free. James Gallagher, BBC News. Domestic violence is a terrible reality for many women and the stresses and strains of the Christmas season coupled with too much alcohol mean that the holidays can be a particularly volatile time. Many police forces are preparing for an increase in reports of domestic violence over the Christmas period. But in Sunderland, a project is underway which works with men who are at risk of becoming abusers before it's too late. Fiona Trott now reports. Welcome everybody, we'll make a start. Being obvious what's ever since last. The new way of tackling domestic abuse. OK, somebody, somebody mentioned money. Who mentioned money? These men are learning how their abusive behaviour is affecting their partner. Is that a reason to stay or a reason to go? She might be the breadwinner of the one. Like, mm -hmm. Obviously she's got no money because she's keeping name on the band. Right. But obviously she'd be better off if she left. The 26-week course involves the charity Bernardo's. It can get up to 20 referrals a month, and that's just Sunderland. Little kicks, little punches, stuff like that, and then it was like vice versa. She was starting to hit me and it was just escalating. This man was referred by his GP. So how has the course helped you? I take time to think about stuff. The course learnt you how to take time out. Um, an hour, an hour away. So even if like I'm texting, I can tell that the texts are getting out of hand, as you would see it. I might just stop texting for now and chill out a little. This project means that we can get to men and help them change their behaviour before they get involved with the criminal justice system. We, we want to stop things escalating to that point because we know when um, the police get called, it's usually quite serious injuries and incidents. But there's another element to this early intervention programme. The local housing association is also involved. Hello there, how are you? You all right? They check the perpetrators are attending the course okay, the and they check up in. on the victims yeah, sure. themselves. You might have something like a broken window, um, broken bathroom door locks, for example, things like that. Um, it could be that we're looking at an antisocial behaviour complaint. It could be we get a call about noise nuisance. But is it actually noise nuisance or is it actually domestic abuse? He was kicking me door in in the middle of the night. Um, me windows were going out. This woman was so afraid of her ex-partner she carried a knife. Her words are spoken by somebody else. And it finally came to the day where he assaulted us and put us in hospital. He got 16 months in jail. I was so pleased. I know it sounds crazy. You know, I was lying in a hospital bed covered in blood. But I was so happy he'd done it. Because to me, I was free. In every community, there's a woman like her. Here in Sunderland, charities hope that by working with the local housing association, abusive relationships can stop before women are put in more serious danger. Fiona Trott, BBC News, Wearside. Cricket now, and England have lost the final test match against India by an innings and 75 runs, meaning they've lost the series 4-0. It also means they've lost eight test matches in 2016. Here's our sports correspondent, Joe Wilson. Here's how India might look from the plane home. It's a view England longed for. One more day. Perhaps with a foretaste of Christmas, the collapse came after lunch. Cook, the captain, first out. Ravi Jadeja once more the bowler. 103 for one. They'd had to wait, but India were off and running. Indeed. Keaton Jennings, a gentle return catch to Jadeja. Now Chennai awoke. After India scored 759 on Monday, England's only incentive was to deny them victory by batting all day. With the help of an LBW review, Root fell for six. Johnny Bairstow on one, up, up and out. Jadeja going after it, takes it. What a catch that is. Jadeja's catch. Who else? 
Still, Mo Inali fought to 44, then this. Take it! Oh, Mo. Six wicket was Stokes, Dawson soon followed for naught, and the England dressing room speechless. With over an hour left in the day, England lost their eighth wicket. But there you go. Dressing room, right. Back came Jadeja to take the ninth. Still over half an hour for India to wrap it up. Jake Ball batted Jadeja bold. His seventh wicket, England all out for 207. They'd lost 10 wickets for just 104 runs. Well, to lose a series 4-0, to lose like this, displays a weak streak far wider than England imagined. And Alistair Cook will now consider his future starting on the flight home. Joe Wilson, BBC News. Time for a look at the weather now with Louise Lear. Hello. Hi there, Sophie. All change on the weather front. Not much Christmas spirit, I'm afraid, in this forecast. For the remainder of this week, running up to Christmas, it turns increasingly stormy at times. Now, the first signs of that already arriving in the far north and west, where we've got widespread gales through Northern Ireland and Scotland, severe gales on exposed northwest facing coasts. And on top of that, we've got a spell of very heavy rain. At least the heavy rain is clearing through pretty quickly due to the strength of the winds. Not too bad for the remainder of the afternoon across eastern Scotland. The odd spot or two of rain and the same two into the Lake District and West Wales. Windy here, but central and eastern areas, actually, it's a better day in comparison to recent in terms of more sunshine coming through. A few isolated showers on Channel Coast, but not too bad. A little bit fresher as well than recent days. Temperatures fairly uniform across the country between around 6 and 8 degrees. Now, as we run through the evening and overnight, that wet and windy weather pushes its way southwards. The rain will weaken as it moves across England and Wales, but behind it some pretty squally showers starting to push into Scotland and Northern Ireland, some of them even falling as snow to lower levels as it turns pretty cold here in rural spots. We'll see temperatures down to freezing. So we start off then with these squally showers driven in by strong winds with rain, hail, even some thunder and snow, chiefly to higher ground during the daytime across Scotland. But down to England and Wales, there'll be this relentless feed of rain through the day, really just grinding to a halt across the Midlands of the southeast corner, but milder here, 9 to 12 degrees, feeling really quite raw up into the far north when you factor in the wind as well. Now, it'll start off quite cold, possibly even frosty across England and Wales on Thursday, but Thursday perhaps the best day in the next few to come. A scattering of squally showers still up into the north, but quieter weather. However, the next storm moves in another deep area of low pressure. This one has been named by the Met Office. The second storm of the winter season, Storm Barbara, is going to bring some heavy rain, but we're more concerned about the strength of the winds. So an amber weather warning has been issued. Be prepared for some disruption due to the strength of the winds, the strongest of which are likely to be as the low pushes away. So as we go through Friday evening, we could see storm force gusts for a time. That low clears away. <sighs> A brief respite for the start of Christmas Eve, but not for long. The next area of low pressure set to arrive Christmas Eve into Christmas Day. So there is the potential for some disruption due to the weather. Keep watching the forecast, please. And tune in to BBC local radio stations for further travel and traffic updates. Sophie. Louise, thank you. A reminder of our main story this lunchtime. The German government says last night's attack on a Berlin Christmas market in which 12 people were killed was an act of terror. That's all from the BBC News at once. So it's goodbye from me on BBC One. We join the BBC's news teams where you are. Bye-bye.